Okay, so today we're going to talk about uh, heart disease and stroke. I'm a paramedic here with Cole County, so welcome to um, EMED. We have a can go into heart disease and stroke. Um, I'm going to show you a video really quick. Um, it's just kind of a fun video to, to watch. This is from American Heart Association. It started out like a totally normal day. Okay, move ejection deadline to the third line after the survey. Oh, okay. care of my heart and I tell the women in my life to do the same. Sounds great, by the way. That's nice for you, but that's not my heart. That is. Make it your mission to save your life and the lives of the women you love. Find out more from the American Heart Association at goredforwomen.org. So, a cute little video for American Heart Association. Um, we'll kind of discuss a little bit about signs and symptoms of heart problems that have on a regular basis. So we see tightness in the chest. Uh, sometimes our patients uh, that we get called for a medical emergency, they'll state that they have some squeezing sensation, a tight sensation in their chest. Also, um, our patients experience pressure sensation. So they may say that they feel like something heavy is setting on their chest, like an, um, an elephant. Um, also, for our males in particular, they'll say that their left arm hurts. It may go down to their fingertips, it may start at their elbows, but sometimes they'll complain of uh, left arm pain or shoulder pain. Jaw pain and neck pain are also um, some symptoms that the patient may have. Um, and females, will they're very atypical when they present with um, cardiac problems, and so they'll complain of having shoulder pain or um, between their shoulder blades, they'll experience like a stabbing type sensation right there in the middle. A lot of females also experience um, upset stomach where they'll have lots of acid on their stomach and so they'll be belching a lot um, or they may feel like they need to throw up and so nausea is a, also a symptom that they may experience. And then we also have increased breathing. Because your 
heart is starving of oxygen, your body is trying to compensate for that, and so it's starting to increase its rate of breathing. And so you may see them panting a little bit or having a faster um, heart or breathing rate. Patient also gets cold, or we call them clammy or diaphoretic, and so they'll have cold sweats. And in that, they'll have cold skin, or their skin will be cooler than normal. It won't be warm to the touch. And you'll start to feel this on their outer extremities, not so much on their core or their trunk area, but we'll feel this in their hands. We'll feel this on their arms. And then we'll see that they may be pale in color. They may have like an ashen color or gray. Um, or we may see that the patient starts to turn blue in the lips. And this is what we call cyanosis or cyanotic. We might also see like where their eyes are, um, kind of where their eyelids are. We might see some blue. We might also see some blueness with their nose or their fingernails. Um, those ladies that don't have any or guys, if you look at the white in your nail bed, that's where we look for the color change also. My clicker is not. Women, again, very typical, meaning they don't present the same signs and symptoms as our males. And so, again, they're going to have the upset stomach or the acid. Um, the gal on the video was showing you that she was kind of holding her chest and then she was kind of taking the tums and rollades. The patient may also feel fatigued, just not normal. Um, they just kind of feel yucky. They just kind of feel like you almost have the flu, flu like symptoms. They'll be lightheaded, again, nauseous. Um, they will also have, again, that stabbing sensation in the middle of their back. And again, they'll have the, na the neck or jaw pain. And she kind of rolled her jaw around, kind of stretched her neck a little bit. And that's very typical for females as well. And then an asymptomatic term uh, or symptom is a right arm pain. Sometimes they don't have that left arm pain or they may have bilateral or both arms where they experience some discomfort. I'm not sure why this is not working. So we're just going to get rid of it. Um, so the treatment of our chest pains, for many EMS agencies, the rule of thumb is that we treat and transport these patients to the most appropriate uh, a facility. Here in Jefferson City, we have two locations, um, and, but our uh, chest pain center is going to be St. Mary's, but Capital Region also has cardiologists uh, in-house, and so we can take them to either or facility. Um, these patients, we would like them to get to the door in less than 60 minutes. Um, preferably that time limit because as soon as you get them to the emergency room, um, they need to go to the cath lab. So the cool thing about us uh, in the field is that as soon as the call gets, um, you know, dispatched to us, is that that's when the clock starts. And so we have a race that we need to get these folks into the cath lab, and that max time is what we'd like to have is 90 minutes into the cath lab. So the cool other thing is, is that now our equipment is bigger and better and just awesome. And so now we can transmit these EKGs. So we're placing you on the monitor and we can get these printouts of what your heart is doing. We can actually send it to the receiving facility. So the cardiologist can look at it right then and there and they can see exactly what we're seeing. And then they can call the cardiology in if it's a weekend or a night or even during the day and say, look, this is what we have. This is where our patient is presenting with. These are the vital signs we have. This is how the patient is. Um, doing at this point in time, their pain feel, and then they can get this patient right into the lab. We don't even have to go into the emergency room. They don't even have to do anything. They'll just take them straight from the ambulance right into the cath lab. So it's a pretty cool deal. This decreases loss of um, heart tissue and muscle damage, and so the patient has a way better outcome than if we were to do it the traditional way where we would go to the ambulance and then we get into the ER and wait a little bit and then we eventually get to the cath lab. So in the ambulance, um, our biggest deal is early recognition, so within the first five to ten minutes of we actually getting hands on with our patient, we're starting EKGs and we're getting a cardiac readout of what exactly that patient is experiencing and if this is cardiac related and whether we need to call on the horn, whether they need cardiology or not, or whether this is just something that we can deal with um, that may not actually be cardiology or cardi cardiovascular, that it could be um, anxiety or other problems. So we'll monitor patients' blood pressure, we'll monitor their heart rate, um, we'll start IVs and give appropriate medications for their heart rate if it's needed, for blood pressures if it's needed. Um, we'll also give this patient oxygen. It may sound very simple, but the patient is, again, starving of oxygen because it's not getting enough oxygen, so their, heart, or their respiratory rate is going to be going up. 
And so we'll give them O2 therapy. Um, we'll give it through a nasal cannula or a non-rebreather. Those are the little masks. And again, we'll call the receiving facility. So what is heart disease? Heart disease is defined um, as the narrowing or complete blockage of our, our blood vessels, our arteries, our veins. Um, the narrowing of these vessels is created with plaque. And so um, when we have narrowing of these blood vessels, there's a decrease to uh, blood volume towards our heart and our brain, which can cause heart attacks. The complete blockage, again, is, is the ceasing of any blood flow to those areas, which eventually will cause damage um, if not reversed. So we have some risk factors that are associated with heart disease. We have your age. So the older that you get, the more risk you have because your vessel is becoming weaker. And so they don't expand or dilate or constrict like they normally would if you were younger, if you were 20s or 30s. You also have smoking as a factor. Um, the byproducts within smoking actually causes more damage to your body than actually the nicotine itself. And so that also um, creates some issues not only for your vessels, but it causes for your lungs. We have gender. Sometimes gender plays in a big role where more um, males are actually more susceptible or females are more susceptible to having um, particular medical problems. Our obesity, if you are a heavier individual, then obviously that weight that your body is carrying around is a big load on your heart. If you are smaller, then it's not as a big a strain on your heart. Family history. This is where it plays in a big thing with your health care provider where they can make care plans for you that if your family, especially on both sides, have cardiac history, then you can be able to diagnose things sooner, you will be more aware of when these things will happen, especially if you have a history of high cholesterol in your family or high blood pressure, your physician will be more alert to actually testing you sooner. And so in your 30s, you may not actually experience that, but somebody maybe in their 40s probably wouldn't have it either, but your physician is going to test you for those things and you may be catching it earlier so less damage is done to your vascular system. Diabetes. Um, diabetes is just the increase and decrease in our blood pressure. We have an insulin hormone, and so this also causes some issues with our vascular um, blood pathways. Um, this is going to decrease the elasticity of your vessels, so the stretching and the condensing of those vessels is going to decrease those. High blood pressure, again, lack of exercise. If we don't exercise, then obviously that's going to be a strain on your heart because it's not getting the workout that it should, and high cholesterol, which is the buildup of plaque within your system. So we need to start eating healthier diets. Now, we don't always have to be on a diet per se, but we need to stay away from things such as yo-yo dieting. Um, these are your whole 30s where you're going to be eating a particular diet for a particular 30 days. This is a huge strain on your body, and it's not meant to do that. You're supposed to be making uh, lifelong choices, so no carb dieting that was really popular, um, all protein diets, those are very popular right now, or just eating fruits and vegetables and you know just meats, those are also very popular right now, unless you're going to stick to a very stringent diet for the rest of your life and never get a ho-ho in your life or ever get a piece of chocolate cake or cookie, then these are not the diets. You need to make lifelong changes. And so um, make your realistic weight loss goals. Make them realistic. Don't make them so extreme that you can't keep those um, life changes or those diet choices that you, you've chosen. Exercising. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have to go to a gym. You can exercise with your friends. You can walk your dog. You can go to the park with your kiddos. This could be a 10 to 15 minute walk a day or every other day. You could do swimming, dancing, yoga, all kinds of things that require just a minimal exercise. And even if you're not able to because of um, particular medical problems that you have or your joints aren't necessarily what they used to be, doesn't mean that you have to have high impact exercise and you can do very low impact such as swimming or walking. Smoking again um, is a big deal because it's very addictive and it's not something that's very easily just gotten rid of. It's not like, oh hey buddy, I'm done. I'm not going to smoke another cigarette ever in my life. Some people have that really strong willpower and others don't. But what's awesome is that we have lots of resources and um, lots of counseling so we can help these individuals who truly do want to stop smoking to help them stop smoking. 
According to the CDC, and we found that this is really, really cool um, data that they had uh, pulled up, is that within 20 minutes of not having a cigarette, your heart drop, your heart rate decreases. And after 12 hours, your carbon dioxide level drops to normal, just within 12 hours, which is pretty cool. Um, two to three weeks, your heart risk drops. And um, I'm sorry, it's not supposed to say lung function. It's supposed to be lung function. I'm sorry, I didn't catch that typo. But it starts to improve. So your heart and your lungs start to improve just after two to three weeks of not smoking at all. And then one to nine months, you start to see a decrease in your coughing. So a lot of smokers, they have just kind of a smoke, or a, uh, what they call a smoking hack, or just a coffer, uh, smoker's cough. Um, and that starts to improve to where they can actually breathe easier. Sometimes they have an increased heart rate, or I'm sorry, uh, respiratory rate, because they're trying to catch their breath. They've got all that junk in there, and their lungs clogging everything up to where they're not able to breathe easier. Um, after a year, your heart attack risk drops to half of that of a smoker. And then in five years, your stroke risk actually drops. And then in 10 years, your risk of cancer decreases to half. And we're not just talking lung cancer, where you're talking um, pancreatic cancer, this is liver cancer, this is kidney cancer. These are all the cancers that you could have. And so it drops it to half, which is super awesome. And then in 15 years, your risk for stroke and heart attack drops to that of a non-smoker. So within 10 years, you could possibly have the lung capacity and the heart capacity of somebody who never smoked ever. So that's pretty gnarly. Um, knowing your numbers, so we're going to briefly talk about blood pressures, your cholesterol, and your diabetic values. This is where it comes into play with your personal care physician to where they can monitor you better, especially if you have a history, again, of high blood pressure in your family or high cholesterol or even diabetic problems later on in life. And we're not talking like the diabetes that you experience in younger life when you're a kiddo. Um, this is stuff where um, you develop it as you get older. So blood pressure values are golden number that we like to see every patient in the whole wide world, but Oftentimes, every patient is not the exact same, and so they all have different values. So we kind of give you a parameter. The golden number is 120 over 80, but your golden number may not be 100 or 120 over 80. And so our 120 number is the systolic. That's your top number, and we like to keep that between 100 and 140. So if you're in that realm, you're good. Okay, we consider you having a normal systolic blood pressure, or top number. Your diastolic is your bottom number, and it's the 80, and we like to keep that between 60 and 90. And so if you're in that realm, again, you should be good, okay? If you're anywhere below or above those numbers in both categories, we consider that we probably need to get intervention involved with our physician, and you probably need to have a consultation with them. Total cholesterol, and a lot of these times we get these confused, but we need both of these things. So HDL is our high density cholesterol, and it's the good cholesterol. It's the cholesterol that helps remove the bad cholesterol. And so we need this inside um, our system, and so it helps us overall improve our health. And so our values, we like to keep it above uh, 40. And then we have the LDL, which is the low density cholesterol. And this is our bad cholesterol. This is where we find that builds plaque within our system, within our arteries. And so this causes the heart problems, excuse me, and so the value needs to be less than 100. These two values combined um, are your total cholesterol. So your HDL and your LDL com combined make your total cholesterol value. Diabetes. Um, diabetes, again, we kind of briefly went over this, but this is a hormone um, inside your body. It's called insulin, and it helps regulate your blood sugars, which is very important to you so that you can function on a daily basis, okay? Folks that have diabetes, either their values are really, really low, and so they need assistance in bringing their values up so that they can function normally, or their values are super, super high, and so they need to take insulin to bring those values down so that they can function normally. Um, we maintain these blood sugars, folks that are normal, they have, they can maintain this hormone throughout their system normally, but sometimes we do need to have medications prescribed to you. This is something that can happen instantly, and so um, these patients will expense, uh, you know, with uh, very high blood sugars, they'll expense, or I'm sorry, experience uh, excessive thirst, they may have delirium, they may be very hot. Um, Patients with very low blood sugars, they may become very clammy, very sweaty, um, may have, again, some delirium. They may even pass out or have seizures because their sugars get super, super low. 
And so when we ask um, patients to do a fasting blood sugar, this is something that your physician will ask you to do. Um, you'll have to fast for 12 hours, and they'd like to see that number um, right around 100 um, or less. And so um, if you have a value higher than that, then you are at risk if not having diabetic or diabetes. So take control of your health by managing your diet, your exercise, your cholesterol, your blood pressure. Um, again, these can all decrease the odds of having any type of cardiovascular problems. Um, so talk to your personal care physician. Ooh, that's, there we go. How do patients get narrowing of their blood vessels? Again, we kind of talked about this with poor dieting, um, poor health choices where we're not maintaining our diabetes, our diabetic levels, or our high blood pressure, our cholesterol, our high cholesterol. And so these narrowing of these blood vessels eventually um, will cause problems to where the blood flow is not getting to the heart the way it's supposed to, and so then it will cause issues with decreased blood flow to the heart. And again, the complete blockage, um, this or the narrowing can cause be caused not just because of bad health choices, but this could also be a genetic thing. Again, this could be something where you have done everything right, you've ate really well, you've exercised all your life, you know, you've kept track of all your values. But sometimes your mommy and daddy just didn't give you the right genes, and so they gave you the bad cardiac genes, right? And so there's nothing that you did to cause this, but there is ways to help improve it before it gets too bad to where you're actually experiencing heart problems, um, where you're ending up in the cath lab itself. Um, so we know what blockages are, and we know what narrowing of the blood vessels are, and so we're going to go into how cardiovascular disease also can affect of your brain. And so it's called a stroke. Um, our patients who experience narrowing or blocking of the pathways in um, our brain are called ischemic strokes. And this is where we start to see facial drooping, we starting to see people have issues speaking. And so it's a brain attack. Have you guys ever heard of that before? No? Okay, so when we have this occur inside of our hearts, we're calling it a heart attack, right? It's a blockage inside or it's a narrowing vessel inside of our hearts. Well, when we have those things occur in our arms and our legs, because they can happen too, these clots are basically plaque just moving through our vessels. And so it can happen and it can stop right in our heart in a tiny little vessel. It can happen in our arms. It can happen in our legs. And those things are called DVTs. It can also happen in our lungs, and these things are called pulmonary embolisms, or PEs. Well, when it happens in our brains, these are called strokes. And so um, it's not just heart attacks that can uh, be these plaque buildups just floating through, the, uh, floating through our vessels. It can also happen in our brains. Another kind of stroke that we have is, again, uh, ischemic strokes. Um, they occur in our brain, but we have another one that's called hemorrhagic strokes. And this is when your vessels either burst or they have hemorrhaging, so where they've gotten some type of blunt force trauma, you were involved in a fall, or you were involved in um, some type of assault and somebody struck you in the head. This could also be something where your head had struck something in a motor vehicle accident. So um, motor vehicle, or I'm sorry, hemorrhagic strokes, um, unfortunately, we can't do anything with those, um, not in the field or actually in the neurology or in the ER. Um, these are something that's just going to have to stop on their own. Um, unfortunately, they typically can't stop the blood flow unless it's to a passageway that they can get to, and a lot of times that's not always the case. Um, so the blood just pumps freely within the brain and causing um, stroke-like symptoms. Now we do have another set of uh, strokes, it's a TIA, this is called a trans ischemic stroke, and these strokes um, present or mimic the exact same thing as an ischemic stroke, and we call these mini-strokes. Um, they will often go away within moments of actually the onset, and sometimes they take up to 30 minutes to actually go away, but these are precursors to actually having um, the big one, as you might say, um, having the uh, ischemic strokes, okay? I'm going to let you watch another video, and this is again from the American Heart Association. Feel free to laugh, because it is a, a quite funny video. Hey, honey. What can I get you? Hi. I like um, cheeseburger with a uh, side of French fries. 
there is such a pie. Hey, man. Yeah, you your fingers moving out of place? Hey, man. The letter F stands for faith. I said, hey, man. No excuse, help yourself. Just go to the in trouble, D-E-R, is where I'm sure you will find what you need if you get in time. Of your time, that's the meaning of P, act swift man, when you can't walk the street, there's an E-R, go there F-A-S-T, they can be you back on your feet. For in the ambulance, we're going to assess patients with um, stroke like. Um, if we get called into the emergency department, or I'm sorry, by uh, dispatch for stroke or possible stroke, um, we'll do some assessments on our patients. And they're going to have um, scale, stroke scales that uh, ass or access these things or assess these things. So we'll have facial drooping or facial droopage. So you saw the gentleman in the video where he was trying to order something and his corner of his mouth drooped from one, you know, lower than the other side. And then we'll also have something that's called arm drifting. And so we'll have our patients stick their arms out in front of them. And as a normal person without any stroke-like symptoms or any complaints, your arms should just go out here, okay? And we'll ask you to close your eyes. And once you close your eyes, that person's arm will drift lower, especially the one that's on the affected side. So if my right side is being affected, something going on in the right side, or I'm sorry, left side of my brain. We'll also have slurred speech, kind of something like I'm doing right now. <laughs> Probably because that thing's video recording, right? <laughs> <laughs> so the patient will ask them questions like, Sally sells seashells by the seashore, or you can't teach an old dog new tricks. And so if they're not able to articulate that or repeat it back to us, that is a 72% chance if one of those three um, in, in that category, one of those three tells us that they have a 75 or 72% chance that something neurologically is going on with them. Now, they may have experienced a stroke prior to our arrival, and if we don't know that, um, obviously we can give some false information to the emergency department. Um, but especially if we get called to a nursing home or a elderly family member and they didn't know the history of that patient, 
Um, sometimes that occurs, but more often than not, you know, your caregivers, your nursing home staff, they know what the patient's normal mentation or their normal mental status is. And so these are new onsets of problems. So things that in the ambulance that we do um, is that we transport these patients again to the most closest appropriate facility and that doesn't mean that the facility that's closest to you is actually the most appropriate facility. For example, Jeff City does not have a stroke center. Um, we do have a facility here in Jefferson City, which is Capital Region, that takes stroke patients and they can give them a product called TPA. And this product, um, they did go through some accreditation, but they do not have neurology on staff. And so they will give the um, first line of drugs for this patient, and then they will eventually determine whether this patient needs those medications. So they'll start off with CAT scans, and then they'll eventually give this patient a medication if they do, in fact, find out that they are ex uh, experiencing a stroke. And then they'll give this medication and then transport them further to Columbia. Um, we do have stroke centers, level one stroke centers in Columbia, and that will be Boone Hospital University um, also has neurology on staff and so they are able to accept and treat those patients appropriately also. So while in the ambulance we're going to manage their airway, um, we're going to give them oxygen if necessary, um, vital signs will be monitored and if treated, it will be treated if needed. So if the, for example, the patient has a very high blood pressure, we're going to try to bring that blood pressure down because that's not good for you to have, again, like we discussed earlier, high blood pressures. Um, we'll send this patient again to where a neurologist can be and so we'll alert that facility as soon as possible so if we get on scene and we say, oh my goodness, yes, this patient is definitely experiencing a stroke, we're going to call them immediately so that they're ready, especially if this is on a weekend or an evening to where the neurology team has already gone home, we want to the, alert them as soon as possible. Um, patients may have slurred speech, again, these are kind of signs and symptoms of what your patient may present with and they may have um, asymmetrical smiles, so again, where part of their mouth or corner of the mouth is up here and the other part is down here, or vice versa. Um, patients may have one-sided weakness. Again, that's where the arm drift comes into play. We may ask you to grip our hands, and so when we do that, we're actually looking for whether the patient is experiencing weakness on one side or the other. We may ask you also to press on our hands. We'll put our hands right up against your feet and ask you to push on our hands like you're pressing on a gas pedal. Again, that is supposed to determine whether you have weakness in that lower extremity or not. Um, patients may have trouble forming complete thoughts or sentences. They may, you may see the wheels turning in their head, but they're just not able to articulate anything, so it comes out to be just garbled mess. Um, patients may also complain of severe headaches, and this can happen in either TIAs, ischemic strokes, or hemorrhagic strokes. They just may complain of just severe headaches. We also um, see in patients, especially with traumatic brain injuries, um, or with patients that have been struck in the head, may see pupils are different in size, um, and that may also indicate that they're having some type of problem. Strokes are cardiovascular disease also. Because they're paired up with your cardiovascular system. We're having either plaque build up in those um, vessels inside your brain. Um, so having a good diet, again, exercising, monitoring that blood pressure, cholesterol, and your blood sugar um, can also decrease the odds. We're just going to kind of basically go over what the video had said um, for the fast. Facial drooping is the F, A, arm weakness, S, speech difficulty, and T is it's time to call 911. If we experience any of these things, then we need to call for help, okay? I want to thank you guys for coming out today, and thanks for bumming with me for, you know, a little bit. And uh, thanks for learning a little bit about heart uh, disease and strokes. Do you guys have any questions? No? Okay. Y'all are awesome. <laughs> thank you.